welcome back to the channel. A few weeks ago, months ago, I don't know how long it's been ago, um, I decided that I would try my hand at doing some interviews of uh, some photographers that I'm friends with, David Sailors, Phil Thatch, and Ron Durant. And those videos have been fairly well received on my channel, and, and I really do appreciate that. I got the idea because of listening to other podcasts of uh, photographers and photography where there is this interview going on about you know how they got started, what they do, and those kinds of things. And so when it was all said and done and the last video had been edited and posted, I got a call from uh, Ron Durant who said, <clears throat> you know, who is, who's going to interview you? Nobody. <laughs> and so Ron took it upon himself to, uh, to record an interview with me about my photographic journey, a little bit about my past. And um, then he was, after he posted it on his channel, he was kind enough to share the file with me to re-edit it with my own intro and post it on my channel as well. And that's what you've got today. So sit back, grab a cup of coffee, Learn about me. Let's see. I had a few questions here. <laughs> so uh, I guess I'll do my intro stuff on the like you did on the side. We're just okay. Go, we get right into the interview. Is that how that works? Yeah, edit it any way you want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, Tim, why don't you tell us uh, what do you do for a living right now? Well, uh, for the next uh, 120 some odd days, <laughs> I you're, on a, you're on a countdown timer. <laughs> I am an assistant principal at Fulton High School in Knoxville. I've uh, been in education now for almost 25 years. I got started kind of late. Um, so I, I live in Chattanooga. I drive to Knoxville every day. So I'm on the road about three hours a day. Makes for a fun life. Yeah, I bet. But but this is my last year, so I'm hitting retirement in June. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so being assistant, is it was assistant principal you said. Yeah. So is that your first? Was that your first stop, or did you have another school you were at before then? Oh no, I started uh, when I first started in education. Um, it was after I moved back from England, and I I was living in Cleveland, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And so when I got my teaching certificate, I started work at uh, Lake Forest Middle School as a seventh and eighth grade English teacher. Um, middle school is just so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I had fun in middle school. <laughs> so, I think I, uh, I, think I held. So I then held after, I, after a few years of teaching <laughs> uh, English, they moved me into to run their computer labs. They had five computer labs. We put all um, all of the students through a computer lab one period a day. Mm -hmm. So I ran I ran those and then I became uh, a, um, a technology uh, trainer for our district in Bradley County. And then I was trying to get into uh, administration and in Bradley County, it's really hard to do that. So I saw a job opening at the Ellen and STEM Academy in Knoxville, uh, which was, it was, they'd been open for a year. And um, they were Knoxville's first 100% iPad school. Hmm. It was their first foray into one-to-one -one technology. And so they hired me. Uh, as my first assistant principal job. And I was there about six years and now I've been at Fulton for five or six years. So STEM stands for, I'm assuming here, let me see if I get this right myself. Okay. Science, technology, um, English and math. Engineering. Engineering and math. Yeah. Okay. I never, I, I that's a guess. I never looked that up on Google <laughs> or nothing. I just, yeah, I just the, always... The, the STEM Academy is uh, it's a it's a one hundred percent magnet school. Yeah, so know you know, I mean, every every high school has its zone where mm -hmm. the the map shows if you live in this area, you go to this school. Well, 
the Illinois STEM Academy is a 100% magnet school, so it draws from all over Knox County schools. And it has uh, 600 students, roughly. Um, they take in 150 every year, 150 new freshmen through a lottery. Um, lottery? Yeah. So, you know, you get you get a lot of kids that, I mean, there are, there are kids that go there because they've got their eye on the prize of what's going to happen in their master's program, you know. And then you've got some kids that go there because um, they – they just need to be in a smaller environment. The the bigger school uh, is is too much for them. And uh, so there's a wide variety of kids there, a wide variety of academic levels when they come in. But, um, you know, they, they, they make it work. It, it's a great school. Yeah. Is that the only one that's, that's there in Knoxville? Uh, they now have another magnet school they call the Career Magnet Academy. And that is uh, located on one of the Pellissippi State uh, campuses. And those students are going primarily for um, leaving school, going into a trade. And so they're striving to get their two-year associate's degree at the same time they graduate high school. I got you. And so this year, I think they had about half their graduates who completed that, which was huge. Really? So, yeah. yeah, sounds sounds interesting. So uh, I noticed uh, I've been on your YouTube channel uh, several times and uh -oh. going back uh, way back. <laughs> your your YouTube channel and and Phil Thatch's YouTube channel goes way farther back than my YouTube channel. Oh goes. yeah, yeah. But uh, I noticed there was a few videos back there of you singing. <laughs> is that something? Uh, is that I something knew you were going here? <laughs> 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 is that is that something you uh um uh, was a career or is that just uh like no, it wasn't a career i wasn't that good i wished it was i would love to have been in a in a southern gospel quartet years and years ago um i uh i've always been um musically inclined i suppose although i have no talent to play an instrument Mm -hmm. um, my brother, uh, who was six years older than me, he sat down at the piano and could play from day one. Uh, and he was, he was phenomenal. In fact, he toured for a little while. If you look way back, I think the very first video I posted, maybe a Paul Davis video, um, where my brother played in his band for a while and they were on solid gold. So, mm -hmm. um, I was doing music in church primarily. Um, I, I was a choir director for a while just as a, you know, as a volunteer um, and did some solo work, did a little bit of work with a trio at one point, but all just, you know, sort of locally in a church. Um, so yeah, that was that video. The, well, there's two videos there, I think, and they're both from uh, what used to be called the Hicks and Baptist Church. It's now called Abba's House. Um, they had a TV program and the pastor invited me to come on and sing one day. And, um, that was, you know, it was, it was a highlight. I, I enjoyed mm -hmm. it. So, uh, I shamelessly posted those videos on YouTube. <laughs> I, I think a lot of, uh, people and, and I've got some technology background myself that I don't, uh, don't let out very much, but I was involved in it for several years before I got into the jobs I'm doing now. And I was musically inclined as a high school student, I was in the band, in the marching band, and I was involved in, in some of that. So I think that kind of, the music kind of goes with technology stuff. It's, you know, uh, I don't know what it is. And and if you, if you had uh, told me in 1976, when I graduated from high school, that I was going to be involved in computer work, I would say, <laughs> you're crazy, because I don't even know what a computer is. Yeah. So, um well, anyway, that's I just I just wanted to ask you about the singing videos. I I've seen a few of them on there, and that was a yeah. Different, every different once in a you. while, I will post one to Facebook just to remind people it's there, get a few more views. <laughs> so let's let's talk about something more interesting. Let's okay. Talk about, let's talk about your photography. Okay. <laughs> how how did you get started in photography? Um, I. I had a 35 millimeter film camera years ago and 
I had I had absolutely no idea how it worked. My images were just awful. Um, I didn't know what ISO was. I didn't know what 100 ISO film was from 400 ISO film. I didn't know how to change the settings on the camera. And I took that camera. We lived in Scotland and England for a while. And I took that camera over there. And the pictures that I have from there, I, I cherish them deeply, but they are just awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're overexposed. They're underexposed. got red in the eyes and all, all the stuff. So when I came back to the States, I thought, you know, I really would like to figure this out. And uh, I bought a Canon 40D and I had two lenses, I think. And so I was looking around to try to find some place to um, help me kind of learn what was going on. And there was a meetup group of Knoxville photographers that I joined. And the very first meeting I went to, <laughs> and so <laughs> how much I didn't know what I was doing. The very first meeting I went to, I think was in December. They were doing uh, Boca shots downtown with the Christmas lights. I didn't know what Boca was. <laughs> I didn't know that I needed a wide open lens to get that. And I, you know, I had the, I had one went to F4 or something, I think was the top. Um, and so when I showed up and I just explained to him, look, I got no idea what I'm doing. They said, well, that's obvious. You don't have the right lens. <laughs> <laughs> they were honest. <laughs> and so I was asking this lady, I said, uh, and I'll never forget it. I asked her, I said, where would I find this in the settings? And she said, have you read your manual? I was like, no, I mean, I don't ever read a manual. She yeah. said, well, on your phone, download the manual and go sit over there on that park bench and find out for yourself. I was like, you must be a teacher. So, <laughs> um, so from there, it, it's just been a constant journey to try to figure out what it is I'm doing. Um, I, I'm still not great at it. I, but I have just fallen in love with it. So what kind of, uh, what kind of photography or what genre are you leaning towards when you do photography now? Um, I really love landscape and waterfall photography. Um, I, I like, I've never been a hiker. I've never been an outdoors guy. Um, but uh, I have found that I really love being out there, wherever there is, um, and trying to figure out what the shot is, uh, trying to find the composition. And I, I think I'm getting better at that. I'm not great at it, but I think I'm getting better at that. Um, and then along with that comes, you know, what lens do you use and why do you use it and what aperture setting are you using and what shutter speed do you need? And there's just, there's so much to figure out um, that it, it is a constant challenge. Um, most things in my life that I have not been very good at, I have dropped like a hot potato before really? I ever had a chance to get any better. But photography has not been that way. I have stuck with it. Um, and I, you know, I'm still learning. I'm, I, I've learned a lot from you. We got to shoot waterfalls. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it, it is a, um, it's a brain activity as much as, uh, as much as uh, a um, creative activity for me. So mostly just landscapes and waterfall. Do you, do you enjoy like doing uh, any kind of um, street photography or uh, I'm, I'm learning street photography most of my street photography i had this conversation with david sailors when we went out one day down in uh, rossville georgia my street photography is not really what a lot of people would call street photography my my, my street photography is more urban photography mm -hmm. i like architecture i like angles i like light and dark I don't like people so much. You don't like people so much. I'm, I'm kind of like that myself. <laughs> but so I'm learning to um, I'm learning to incorporate people and the actions of people in my shots. And mm -hmm. uh, I went to um, I went to London this last June for something called the Photo 24 Challenge. 
Uh, and that is, uh, we, so we start at noon on a Saturday and we shoot pictures until noon on Sunday and we wow. don't stop. You don't stop. And so street photography was one of the things I got a video about it way back where, but street photography was one of the things I was going to try my hand at to go from, Hey, that's really cool. Snap, move on to, okay, this is a great spot. I'm going to sit here for a while. And I'm going to wait for the people to come into my shot. And so I'm, and I enjoyed that. I'm getting better at that, but I, I'm, I'm a very introverted person. And so, you know, getting in people's faces or having them see me with a camera, taking their picture, something just doesn't feel right inside of me. And it's a challenge I have to try to overcome, but yeah, I do, you know, I like, I like taking um, wide angle, ultra wide angle photography inside churches and things like that. Um, getting those big dramatic lines, that kind of thing. Um, there's a number of different kinds of photography that I like to do. But if I had to choose one, it would it would come down to something outdoors, landscape, waterfalls, those kinds mm -hmm. of things. Have you done any? Uh, have you done any shooting like um, in the springtime? Uh, I'll give you an example. I spend a lot of time uh, in the area where I'm at looking at wildflowers mm. and a lot of macro type shots, focus stacking type macro shots. And have you ever tried that kind of photography? I, I have played with that. Uh, <laughs> not very successfully yet, but I, I have played with it. I had, uh, I bought a uh, Venus Laua. 100 millimeter, two times macro lens, fully manual. Um, and so and I could basically just use it on a tripod. And I, I enjoyed doing that. I did, but I didn't know anything about focus stacking when I first got it. I had no idea what I was doing with that. So now I have the uh, Canon RF 100 millimeter macro. And I, I'm... I'm really enjoying doing macro photography with that with that particular lens. I may not ever buy another one. Mm -hmm. I might not buy a different focal length, but that lens is that, that's a beautiful lens. And, I think I um, think every photographer should have a macro lens in his bag yeah. or in his arsenal. Anyways, you there are so many different. Well, if you get if you get to a point where you can't get outside because of weather or whatever, uh, I remember when when COVID started. Um, David Sailors and Phil Thatch and Aaron uh, started a um, uh, kind of like this, kind of like a, a YouTube live deal. And they had a bunch of us join in. I knew I'd known just a little bit about Phil. I hadn't met him personally up front, but I joined in with them. And it was right at the very beginning of COVID, right? Like April the 3rd. And they come up with these little challenges and we sent our photographs in to Aaron and then they would come back on a week later and we would view those photographs and they came up with some wild things. And, and it really stretched your imagination in the kitchen. I said uh, there was a thing. I, I forget what it was called, but my setup was this. I had a glass bowl, uh, uh, a measuring bowl, and it was full of water. And I set up a uh, uh, table that we use in the uh, in your chair to eat supper with uh, whatever you call those in front of my black refrigerator okay and i set up my camera no flash just had a a, a regular old work light and i got my wife to come in and help me and i was using my d500 so i was on 10 frames per second and she had a, a lemon and she would drop it into the water Okay. And it, of course, it was we had a, we had a towel on the floor. It was splash, and we did this for a long time trying to get the right photograph, you know. And I would just I would just lay on the shutter, and she would drop it, you know. And then I would go through the pictures and look at them, and we it was kind of neat. And we were using the macro lens for that, and uh, I, I I really enjoyed those challenges they had. Uh, they they yeah. were pretty creative, but yeah. I I I do go out a lot now. The only thing about um, wildfire photography is a lot of times uh it needs to be no wind if you're going to do it outdoors it needs to be no wind and you're probably going to be down on your knees okay yeah. so i mean it's it's a lot of fun i enjoy doing them um so you know you you talked about doing some traveling 
What are some of the places you have actually uh, traveled to? Um, I have done a lot of photography in the Dallas area. I have some friends from education that are out in that area. Uh, I have I have found my my place of Zen. <laughs> zen. <laughs> Um, at Pasigrill Beach uh, in Florida, just south of um, St. Pete. And uh, so I have I've been around the St. Pete area, the Tampa area, um, and, and, and those kinds of places shooting pictures. I've been to the Miami area to do pictures. Um, Did you travel there? specifically to to do that or was that just a your like a side the day? miami trip uh i was there for a conference and so what i've done over the last few years is anytime that i go to a conference at a, at, you know out of state i always add two days to my travel yeah makes and sense. so you know, and then usually that's over a weekend so i'm not missing any school yeah but of coming home on friday i'm coming home on sunday yeah. And so then I pick up the hotel for those last two days. Yeah. But I didn't have to pay for any transportation. So I'm already there. So yeah. like I was in Las Vegas not too long ago, taking pictures there. And I've been to Washington, D.C. I've been to um, Halifax, Canada, um, you know, Pennsylvania. I've been to I, I've been everywhere, man, as the song goes. <laughs> what about what about your overseas trips? Have you done many of those? Yeah, so I, I've I've done a few. I went on a uh, a spring break trip with students and teachers from the Ellen and STEM Academy about it might be seven years ago now, um, and we went to Rome and Assisi and Florence. Wow! Um, and I I just I just fell in love. You know, I mean, there was just so much to photograph. So um, last year. Uh, in March, spring break, I went back to Rome, and uh, that that was quite the trip because I was on I was on the plane in Chattanooga, <laughs> and the ice storm hit. Ah. And I sat on the plane in Chattanooga for six hours. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Wait, so you know, I had to reroute all my flights and all that. That was the trip where my luggage didn't make it. I spent the week in Rome without a suitcase. Fortunately, I had most of my camera stuff with me. No tripod. I'd do everything with a platypod. Um, but that was kind of a trial run for me for the trip that I'm taking this March. I'm going to Assisi, Italy for a week. Um, and it, it's mostly about um, some some writing I want to do, but it, it will be interspersed with photography as well. Now, when you was on one of your trips, and I'm, I might have been the one you went to Rome last spring, did you get um, did you get questioned by authorities <laughs> uh, for for having your camera yes. or something? What what happened well, there? Well, here's the thing: I went to the Vatican City, um, and you know there is this. There is this line of barricades. I mean, you can just walk through them. But on one side is Rome, and on the other side is a totally new country called oh. the Vatican City. And so I set up right there. I mean, I was like three feet inside. And and if I had, I, I had the DJI uh, Pocket 2, and if I had just stood there and held it in my hand and talked, I, I would not have been stopped, but it comes with this little tiny tripod and I set it on top of one of those stanchions and walked back a few feet and the head of security, I mean the head of security <laughs> and three police cars <laughs> descended <laughs> upon me and they wanted to know who I was and why I was there. And, and the deal was if, if you're going, because I had it on a tripod, even though it's that little tiny thing, yeah. Um, they thought maybe I was trying to make money off of my video oh. and I would have to have had a permit. Um, oh. and so, you know, that, they had to do, I mean, they called Interpol. They did a search on my, on my ID. I was there probably 30 or 45 minutes until they finally decided to let me go. And all I was trying to do was film a video about the fact I'd lost my luggage. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's that's interesting you know you 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 drag out a little bitty pocket two tripod yeah yeah it's got one knows they're just hard, you can put them in your pocket they're just so little yeah and then that would draw attention to you yeah i, I think it confused them i'm not sure they'd ever seen one before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, i think a lot of people are confused by, by anything, <laughs> anything technology wise i mean uh, I've been in, I've been drone photography and are, are flying drones for six or seven years. And when I first started, uh, it was a scary time. You know, I hid it in my car. You know, if I did get it out, I made sure there wasn't people around. Yeah. And th- people always felt threatened by it, and it was technology they didn't understand. And even today, I'm very cautious about when and where I, I actually do my flying. I have to have a purpose to fly, so. Yeah. But anyway, people are people are scared of technology sometimes. But uh, what uh, you have a YouTube channel. Yeah. And uh, what made you what made you start a YouTube channel? Well, <laughs> it was sad. It was sad. <laughs> I had this idea uh, because I'm an educator, and I had this idea that I could make videos for people like me who didn't know anything. And I could talk about, here's the mistakes I've been making. This is what I did to correct it. And it was gonna be more of an educational type channel. And I learned really, really quickly as I got feedback from actual professional photographers uh, and they're friends of mine. So it wasn't just out of the blue. I learned very quickly. I didn't have a clue what I was talking about. (laughs) <laughs> so hey, I'm um, there. it's hard yeah, i'm there with yeah. you <laughs> yeah so I, I quickly decided that it was going to be more uh just about the pictures that i'm taking and you know I, i'll talk through things like like all the other channels do and so i thought okay so if i'm going like if i'm going to benton falls i'll set up my camera i'll get the b-roll shot of walking past the camera i'll go back and pick up the camera i'll walk down set up another shot walk past the camera and i was doing that for a while and i thought you know what this is not only is this time consuming but i'm boring myself so. yeah, yeah. Some of, sometimes <laughs> so what i've tried to do now is I, and most of the time what i've tried i do a few things about gear not much but most of the time what i'm trying to do is tell a story that's really what i want to do is tell a story and uh and and i'm learning how to do that better as time goes on i think um so when you uh when you go out to do your uh your youtube or to do a video for youtube do you do you sit there and kind of plan that out ahead of time or do you just wait you just wake up on sunday morning or saturday morning (laughs) so i think i'll go over here um I know where I want to go, but what I'm trying to do now and, and what I hope to do a lot more of after I am retired and have the time yeah, is, really. is I would like to script it out more. And so I have like, I, I just did a video. I'm working on a video this week for Saturday because I'm a little behind mm-hmm. um, on iPhone photography for travel photography. And so I, I wrote a script of what I wanted to say and the 10 things that I wanted to talk about. And then that allowed me to plan out the B-roll shots I needed. And so I could create a checklist to make sure that I had them all because I, I come back from shooting a waterfall or some other place I've been. And I realized I don't have enough B-roll to make a video. You know, it's just me on the camera and nobody wants to see me on the camera all the time. I need to tell the story. I need more than that to tell the story. And so uh, I'm I'm starting to script things out a little bit, get the B-roll shots I need, make sure that I have them all, make sure that they're all okay. Um, and uh, hopefully as, as over the next year, um, the, the quality of the videos will be a lot better. It's funny. You, you talk about the uh, scripting of the story and, um, and b-roll i i uh when i go out to do photography well i don't really think so much that i'm going to do a video there might have been a few that i've done that i on purposely went out and actually did uh video just but i'm more about concentrating on my photography 
sure. and it just it just so happens I have my video camera with me or I can do some talking and I think what I'm more into is is the teaching part or trying to help people um, learn different techniques and I am terrible at at <laughs> purveying that out of my voice i just can't get i i can come out of the gate for about 10 minutes and then i just fall way behind in the pack okay yeah i just yeah. you know so <laughs> you know, i've never really thought about my videos and i think we've talked uh, phil and i might have talked about this one time i don't really think about myself as a storyteller um you know uh, a little bit different technique i guess but um i don't care if anybody watches them it doesn't bother me any, you know, I don't, I don't count on that, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. You know. But um, anyway, that's pretty interesting. So the, um, the YouTube channel, uh, when you get, when you get retired, you hope to grow that a lot more than what you are now. Yeah. I, uh, I was sitting at 499 subscribers January 1st. And my goal has been to get to a thousand subscribers by the end of this year. And I set that goal at the beginning of last year. And I knew 500 was going to be a magic number. And now that I'm at 500, there, there's something about people watching your video and seeing you've got a few subscribers that they tend to subscribe. And so I've added uh, like 45 people in the last month, hmm. which it would have taken me all year to have added 45 people last year, you know? Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, my, my goal, you know, if, if you're going to make money on YouTube and I don't, I don't, I don't ever see myself as a, you know, a full-time YouTuber who's doing this for a living. That's not my goal. If I could make enough money to buy a cup of coffee, <laughs> At least that's once a much. week, you know. <laughs> that's not much. <laughs> no, but you know, so you know, a thousand subscribers, four thousand watch hours, and and that's what you have to have to start making money. But in addition to that, you know, you've got to have videos that retain eyeballs, mm -hmm. and so the views alone are not enough. They have to stay with the video. Yeah. And right now, my retention rate is not good, and I, and I think it's because most everything that I've done has just been on the fly and I haven't really thought through what I should be doing. If you, uh, if you did, if, and I thought about this too, if you've done videos that were shorter, I mean, like under five minutes, do you think the retention rate would be higher? Well, it might be. Um, what I, what I have found is, you know, I make videos typically from eight minutes all the way up to 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, the percentage of time people are watching those videos doesn't really change much. I mean, people are going to know in the first 30 or 45 seconds if they're going to stay with you or not. I agree. I, I'm the same way when I watch somebody's video. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of like, you know, if, if you're if you're if you're the boss and you're hiring someone you know, in the first 30 seconds, if this interview is going anywhere or not. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, people are like that with YouTube as well. I'm like that. I mean, I, I, I look at something, I see a, I see a thumbnail that might interest me, a title that interests me. I do look at how long the video is because if it's 30 or 45 minutes, I'm probably not going to watch it, but you know, if it's 12, 15 minutes long, or even up to 20 minutes long, I'd be like, okay, let's give this a try. And sometimes I can just tell like in eight seconds, this person is going to bore the living daylights out of me and, mm -hmm. I, and I click off. And I'm sure most people feel that way about my videos. So I'm trying to find a way to make them a little more engaging to keep people involved. Um, and that's, that's not an easy thing to do for somebody that's not that creative. So. <laughs> well, you know, uh, that's one of the, one thing I like to do. I have certain people I follow certain people I trust their videos and then I'll find new people their 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 channel will pop up based on something I'm watching and I'll say oh what's this about and I'll go right. over there and click on their thing and then I find it I might find a new person I want to subscribe to but one of the things I I I constantly do and I do it consistently 
is I don't scrub through a video. I usually, if I get into it, I usually stick it out all the way to the end. I mean, yeah. at, at normal speed and watch what they have to say. And, um, you know, sometimes um, there's that one guy, um, the camera conspiracies, is that him? Yeah, yeah. I like to watch him because I just like his humor, okay? Yeah. But sometimes, you know, I watch his, his 15 minute video and I might make it to 12 minutes. Okay. Right. Well, I've right. had enough of him, you know. Yeah. So yeah. I may not I may not finish his video. But then there's uh learning things or even a gear review. Gear reviews are are big for me uh to watch, not to do, to watch. Yeah. So I guess, you know, when you think about what you're actually interested in, maybe that's the kind of video you should be doing since they that's well, the kind of they yeah. Interested. I mean, if if it was just about the views, if that's all it was, um I would be doing gear videos every week. You know, I I yeah. would I would rent something, I'd do a review on it, I send it back. Um, or buy it, send it back. Um, but you know, I, the 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 gear review videos that I've done have strictly been about things that I've actually purchased and used. So they don't come up a lot. But I, I think it is true that for photography in particular. People are searching for how to do something, you know, that they're not searching for, Hey, what's the latest thing on Benton Falls? Right. Now I have done that because I want to see, especially if it's some, if it's a waterfall I've never been to. Yeah. And I know I want to go there and shoot pictures. I will find videos about that spot. Mm -hmm. I'll see what people have done. I'll see what it looks like, but, but I'm scouting for something in particular. And for the most part, People that are just searching for things are searching for either either they want to re, they want to know should I buy this lens should I buy this camera body or yeah. you know or you know like you recently looking for a tripod yeah I mean th those kinds of things they just get more searching so they get more views that's yeah. not. That, that's not what I want to do. I'm I'm not a, I'm, in that respect. I'm not about just the views. What I what I'm trying to do is create better quality videos that keep people engaged longer. And one of the things in in the research that I'm doing for that, because you know I'm, I'm trying to research this out. I'm not just coming up with the, off the top of my cuff. One of the things that I do know about myself and my videos is I talk too dang slow. I just do. There's there's too much downtime. And so I need to learn to sort of pick the pace up just a little bit, cut out all the lagging moments. And, you know, it, I, I might shave a minute and a half off my video just by cutting out the spots where I'm not saying anything. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, well, I'm kind of like you too. I'm, I'm a little slower speaking and I let, uh, sometimes my wife will watch one of my videos and she gets on, um, but she's pretty critical, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't let that, I don't let that sway me, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and I don't always, uh, well, she, if she, only time she'll, she'll pick up a video. She, if she happens to pick it up off my Facebook page and she's not a big Facebook user, but she does subscribe or she is a friend of mine on Facebook. So she'll pick up my pictures That's that nice. I post and stuff. And if I post a video, she'll post it and, uh, or she'll read, she'll watch it or watch part yeah. of it, you know, but, um, I think, you know, uh, the people who talk really fast in their videos and trying to pump it out quickly, I I've got several, I subscribe to that I, that I can name that do this. I find myself backing up and re listening to what they just said, because it's coming yeah. out too quickly. Yeah. So that's why a while ago, I, I kind of mentioned, um, the, the five minute videos or the six minute videos being able to condense everything from a 15 minute video into five or six minutes. Sure. You know, and I thought about that several times. I got, I got things that I want to show people like I'm in Lightroom and stuff. And, um, I've just not sat down and done it yeah, uh, and done the videos to do it. And I really need to try that and make them short. So one of the, one of the guys on YouTube that really, fascinates me and he, he posts about twice a week is anthony morganti right 
You never see his face. No. Never. And he talks about Lightroom, Photoshop, uh, Luminar, you know, whatever software program he's got, yeah. you know. But you know, I've seen this. I've seen, no, yeah. short five, six minute videos. And I do watch them because he's talking about software. Yeah. He's talking about maybe a technique that I was not aware of in Lightroom, you know, because when Lightroom does an update, I don't, I don't go through trying to find everything they just updated. You know, I'm comfortable with the, the process that I edit my pictures at and, and I don't really want to change anything yet. So, yeah. So I think sometimes the smaller, the shorter videos. I think I'm going to try a few of those myself. So what, it, um, I guess you already touched on some of these, but what is your your long-term uh, goals uh, with your photography besides your YouTube channel? Yeah. Well, I I do hope that I can, you know, I'm about to be retired, so there will be very little income. But I'm hoping that I can find ways still to get to new locations and do some traveling. Um, but there is so much, as you well know, there is so much to photograph oh. right here in eastern Tennessee. Within an hour of the house. The landscape and waterfalls. Mm -hmm. I don't have to travel far. No. You know? Um, so I I what I hope is that I can uh find some new places to to take pictures, but more importantly, find ways to take better quality images, um, that they're, I get a sharper focus. I've got a better composition. I do better in Lightroom. So mm -hmm. it will, it will continue to be a constant learning process for me, mm -hmm. um, that hopefully will have bigger dividends down the road. Now you're a, you're a Canon shooter. Yes. Have you always been Canon? Yes. Okay. So, luck of the draw. Uh, pardon it was just luck of the draw yeah it, it, it's what i started with and it it it's like uh you know it, it's like my phone once you've paid for apps you don't go from an iphone to an android no <laughs> no you lost everything so you know they just suck you in and I, i've got all this glass i've been buying for canon and i will i will probably always shoot canon so since you're approaching your retirement soon have you got to the point where you you feel like you have the gear that you need and you don't need to look any further or is there, or is there a few more pieces of gear you'd like to have before you retire? Uh, I'm always wanting more gear. There's no question about that. I, I think I have because I've, because I've invested in the RF lenses for the mirrorless bodies, which are just phenomenal pieces of glass. Uh, I think I have, everything that I absolutely need to do what I want to do. Uh, and then, you know, Canon comes out and brings out this 135 millimeter. <laughs> I'm like, man, that's a beautiful lens. <laughs> but I won't be buying one. I have no use for it. I, you know, yeah. if I was a portrait photographer or wedding photographer, I'd probably buy one, but it, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't fill an empty void for me and what I have now. Well, that that's like me, uh, you know, in the Nikon line, um, I'm shooting the, the Nikon Z6 II and uh, they came out with the Z9 this year or last year. And it's a $5,000 body, which is it's $5,000 I don't have. And it's really $5,000 I don't need to be spending because as I am, I am, <coughs> excuse me, as I'm reminded many times over, that uh, I'm not a professional. This is not my paid gig. Right. I'm a hobbyist. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, I would love to have a Z9 and, you know, but I'm not going to buy one. I think I'm happy with where I'm at and I'm just trying to finalize some things. My wife retires in about three weeks. So oh, wow. our, our income is going to change quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't retire to the end of 2024 and that'll be another big hit uh, when I retire. So in about, well, basically right now, my gear buying days are just about over with. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I hear you. Yeah. So you know, I, I have, you know, I'm, okay, I'm okay with that. Yeah. Really. Well, I, you know, I bought, I bought the 15 to 35 F 2.8. That was the first really expensive lens 
that I bought. When I was shooting with the 40D and the 70D, um, I bought EFS lenses. I bought the cheapest lenses there were. I didn't know the difference in glass, okay? Um, and once I realized the mistake that I had made investing poorly up front, I decided I wasn't going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So I bought the 15 to 35, and then I bought the 28 to 70 F2.0 rather than the 24 to 70. I, I love that lens. And then I bought the 70 to 200, which was the final missing piece. Yeah. So I could get by with those three lenses. Now, I also have a 24 to 105 F4 that I really love for just a walk around mm -hmm. lens. And I've got, and for my trip to Assisi in March, I'm taking the 24 to 240 um, so that I don't have to take the 70 to 200. And I'm just trying to save weight. Um, and then I've got like a 16 millimeter prime and a 35 prime and a 50 prime. I don't wow, know. You got, you got a lot of lenses. Yeah. I mean, I don't need those lenses. They were just fun to buy. You know, yeah, so is everything is everything you got uh, for the mirrorless or you got some adapted lenses? I have a couple of I have a 24 millimeter that was a, uh, an EFS lens and I, and I have a Canon adapter for that. Um, and then I have I still have the 85 millimeter that was a, that has an adapter. Yeah. I, I could get rid of a lot of lenses. I could. But, you know, you don't get anything for them now. Most of them. And so it's like, no, it's you know, tough. You just keep them. You know, just don't <laughs> just don't buy anything from China and try to return it. <laughs> you should have seen the lady when I walked. I was at the UPS uh, store. I went to the I was UPS about to order one. <laughs> <laughs> she says, you don't want to know. I said, oh, yes. I said, by the way. I said, the top of this box needs to be taped up. I said, would you mind taping it up? She goes, you can buy some tape right over there. I oh, said, you, I said before I buy that tape, you tell me how much it's going to cost to ship because I may not be spending any money in this store. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked it up and the, there was a young girl at the over at the next station. And she told me what, I guess this has happened before. And she said, what most people do is instead of returning it, they just sell it. Yeah. So when she told me it was going to cost three hundred dollars to send this back to China, I went no. You know, I said I'm not doing that. I'll keep it before I do that. You know? uh, Anyways, yeah, don't buy anything from China. I could have bought it from Amazon, but the problem was is they didn't have that particular model with the Arca Swiss head, and yeah, uh, that I had to order it directly from from the company. So yeah, we'll we'll see. I've sent them an email begging on their mercy to. See to see if they've got a, a guy over here on a foreign exchange program that'll carry it back for me or something, you know. Well, anyways, that's all I got to ask you, Tim. It's been a, a short interview for me. But, that's uh, all right. I, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, and uh, I'm glad you agreed to do it because uh, I know you did uh, David Saylor's a Georgia photographer first. Yeah. And then, and then you did Phil Thatch. Yeah. And then, you, then you did me. And after you did me, I just, I thought to myself, well, I says, well, who's going to do Tim? <laughs> I said, well, I guess I'll do Tim. You know, somebody, somebody needed to do Tim. So uh, you well, can't I, be appreciate, I appreciate you thinking that way and offering it. It, it was, uh, it's an honor to be here talking with you. Yeah. Well, I consider you a good friend. I'm glad Phil uh, introduced us and, too. and Phil too. Phil's a good friend too. I enjoy going out photography with both of you. It's just too bad that we live a hundred miles apart from each other. And it's, it's hard to get out. Otherwise I'd probably be out with you guys all every weekend, you know? Well, you know, just keep in mind that after June 2nd, yes, I, I'll be, I'll be much more able to go with you some places. So yeah, <laughs> don't forget I'll, about me. I won't forget about you. <laughs> okay. Well, Tim, uh, you got anything you want to add? I'm good, Ron. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. This has been fun. Let me, let me, uh, let me stop this recording.